So Ecclesiastes for Beginners, lesson number six, entitled The View from the Top, Ecclesiastes chapter four, if you're following in your Bible. So in our last several lessons, we have explored with Solomon the various lifestyles that he pursued in his quest for satisfaction and joy, and satisfaction and joy without reference to God. So he's pursued pleasure, uh, wisdom and folly, different views of work, and of course the seasons of a person's life. Uh, one final area that Solomon commented on was the pursuit and the exercise of power and wealth. And so he begins the exploration of this area in chapter, ch uh, chapter number four by stating the idea that what you see is not necessarily what you get. In other words, what you see from the top is not, you know, as you're on your way to the top, is not necessarily what you're going to get when you finally get to the top. Okay? Uh, Charles Swindoll summarizes this passage of scripture in his book, Living on the Ragged Edge, and I want to quote a little section. He just explains it so perfectly, so uh, you can read along with me. He says, um, we have been inundated with books, seminars, courses, and speeches on the subject of top-level management and success-oriented leadership. The hype has never been greater, nor the lure more effective. Indeed, we have largely been convinced that the achievement of an impressive position brings lasting satisfaction and a liberating sense of pleasure. But for the executive, the proverbial pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is not what it appears to be. More often than not, managers have head-on collisions with intense pressure, political rivalry, economic anxiety, and inescapable loneliness. Centuries ago, King Solomon addressed the emptiness of those who make it to the top of their profession. His words live on today. They can make a difference in our lives if we will hear them well and heed their cry. So let's go to what Solomon actually says about life at the top, perhaps review a bit of history about his own rise to power. Solomon lived in the real world of politics and power and wealth. He, obsessed, he observed military and political rivalries as well as the pursuit of great wealth and power not only by those around him, but by himself as well. He was born into power. He was one of the king's sons. Solomon's own rise to power was full of intrigue as his brothers were jockeying for position while their father David, Saul's father as well, grew old and feeble. And it was only after his mother Bathsheba and Nathan the one who originally charged David with adultery with Bathsheba, that prophet, uh, eventually Bathsheba goes to that very same uh, prophet and they plan together to save Solomon's life by plotting to have Solomon named king before the other brothers were anointed and could mount some sort of power base. You know, they kind of cut him off at the pass. So Solomon got rid of his enemies and he increased his wealth and power through government and heavy taxation. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> he was no stranger to the fierce competition that takes place at the top, and in his journal he gives us an idea of what the view from the top is really like, from experience. So from his perch, he sees three things. First of all, he sees <clears throat> oppression. He sees oppression. In verse one he says, then I looked again at all the acts of oppression which were being done under the sun. And behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed and that they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of their oppressors was power, but they had no one to comfort them. So he doesn't describe in detail, but rather he makes a kind of a general reference to what was happening in his day. And what was happening in his day was oppression. Now the word oppression means to press against, to treat with unjust harshness or <clears throat> excuse me, with tyranny, or to cause mental or physical hardship. From his view at the top, that's what he could, that's what he could see. 
you know, rulers thirsty for power, landowners greedy wealth, the list is endless and the crimes are countless. You know, it's interesting, do you notice in this passage what he says? He says, those who are oppressed, they suffer and they have no one to rescue and comfort them. The injustice is unbearable because they are powerless. Here in this country today, if you're an oppressed minority, for example, you have some sort of recourse. You can express your will, you can march in the street, you can vote, you can put together a lobby group. You know, we, have, we have ways to be able to push back against any type of injustice and oppression. But in Solomon's day, there was no voting, there were no interest groups. If you were poor and had no power, you were at the bottom and you stayed at the bottom. And the ones at the top made sure that you stayed at the bottom. So you know, Solomon is commenting on this. Those who are oppressed, there's no justice for them. They are having a miserable life. But then he says, those who are doing the oppressing, those who have the power, the power to actually change things if they wanted to, but like the oppressed, he says, they have no one to comfort them either. Whoa. So the ones who are being oppressed, they have no one to comfort them. And the ones who are doing the oppressing, they have no comfort either. What's his point? Well, the idea is that both of these people will die. The oppressed will have a miserable life and then they'll die. The ones who are oppressing them may have a better life, but the very end of their life is exactly the same. They're going to die. And neither of them can escape or be comforted from this fact that they're both going to die. In verse two he goes on and he says, so I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. So his point is, if this be true, that there's no comfort, whether you're at the top or at the bottom, then a person is better off dead because at least there the pain of oppression doesn't exist and the fear of death is no longer because you're already dead. He continues in verse three, but better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. So he has an afterthought. You know, verse two, you know, it was like that was his original conclusion. Since both groups are being oppressed, or both groups are going to die, you know, it's better you never lived anyway. And then he has another thought. And as an afterthought, Solomon expresses the idea that, well, it's better not even to be born this way one never sees the oppression from either side and never has to dread death to begin with. Again, this is not a happy letter. <laughs> this, is not, you know, this is not a joyful, you know, uh, joyful ideas being expressed here. So how many people have used this argument not to have children? I've, I've heard people make this argument, you know, believing that this present world is the worst of places and our times are the most dangerous of times. You know, oh, better, we don't, better you not bring any children into this world. I've heard people actually say that. And yet Solomon, 2,500 years ago, expresses the exact same idea. Yeah, I guess the world is so bad, he says, you know, better not even to be born. Another thing that Solomon sees from the top, envy. Now you would think that success and power and climbing the ladder produces contentment, but much of the time it only produces envy, or in other word, rivalry, right? So in verse four he says, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity and striving after wind. So here he explains that much of the time success kindles envy in others and rivalries and that many strive for power and wealth in, over, in order to overtake others or not to be surpassed themselves. Well, what do we call this here in modern day parlance? Keeping up with the Joneses, right? And we say, well, I'm, you know, in our own minds we say, well, I'm so glad I'm not like that. Other people are like that until your neighbor builds a, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, a sunroom in the back of his house. Or until your uh, you know, brother-in-law buys a brand new car. 
all of a sudden your car was okay. You know, your, your 97 Taurus was looking fine. <laughs> Until your brother-in-law bought a new car and then all of a sudden your 97 Taurus actually looks like a 97 Taurus, right? Nothing new. You know when he says nothing new under the sun? As far as human emotion is concerned, nothing new under the sun. So he's saying here, you know, the primary motive for striving that some do for success and power is not so that they can have, you know, they can right injustices and have influence to uh, uh, balance the iniquities of the more unfortunate. It'd be nice if that were the case. I want to be the mayor because I just want to fix everything. Yeah, right. I want to be the president, right? No politics here, no right or left. Just the natural intention, I want to rise to power. Do we really think people want to rise to power only to help the poor? Come on, come on. Usually it's to feed ego, to protect fragile self-images, to insulate self from the suffering of others. People want to get, listen, <laughs> people want to get rich and when they're very rich, where do they live? Well, they live in places that have walls and fences. That's where they live. Why? They want to keep out the riffraff. <laughs> That's why. So this striving and pushing for the top, he says, is vain because it accomplishes nothing in giving one the security he feels will have, that he'll have at the top. And worse still, it often provokes others to jealousy. And the end result, therefore, he says, is profitless for everybody at the top. Remember I said at the beginning, he says, the view from the top, you think the view from the top is going to be great as you're on your way, and then when you get there, you realize, man, it's not so great after all. And we don't have to be the king of anything. How, how many of us, you know, I mean, before I became a preacher, I worked for companies, corporations, and I remember you know, thinking, boy, I'm just a clerk now, but if I got to manage you know, my section, oh yeah, the money will be good, but I'll be the boss, I'll be the boss. And then when I finally got to be the manager of the section, what a headache. Because <laughs> I had to deal with people. <laughs> As a clerk, I just dealt with paper. That was okay, paper doesn't talk back to you. <laughs> paper doesn't take a 35 minute break in the morning. So you know, certainly the thing that I learn as I study this and as I you know, make lessons is, man, life has not changed. People have not changed. You know, 3,000 years go by, we're all the same. So verse five, he, he continues to talk about envy and he says, um, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. So now he's going to make a comparison, okay? So he contrasts the selfish ambition, uh, ambitious person to the person who doesn't strive at all, who has no ambition about anything. The lazy man, the folding of hands, is a reference to sleep. And here he's saying, you know, the lazy man, he wastes his life, he consumes his own flesh. He wastes his life. So uh, you know, we have people who have that attitude. You know, turn on, tune out. The generation of the flower children, good example of this other extreme. The lazy man wastes his life, he says, by not caring about anything. Some people, they care about everything. They want to get to the top. When they get there, they're disappointed. And other people just waste their entire life away and stay disappointed. In verse six, he says, one hand full of rest is better than two fists full of labor and striving after the wind. So here he's, you know, he's contrasted the two and he says the balanced person is the one who is content, one handful, with what he has. If a man is satisfied with what he has, he will have quietness, meaning peace and satisfaction, freedom from envy of others' position and success. I mean, what good is having a lot and being at the top if you're not at peace with yourself, what's the point? You can't enjoy what you've gotten, what you've worked so hard to get. So a few quick rules here about being satisfied with what you have. How do we, how do we achieve the state that he's talking about here? You know, one hand, I'm satisfied with what I have. 
a couple of rules. Number one, keep your eyes on your own stuff. Whatever stuff you got, keep your eyes on your own stuff. You know, the commandment in Exodus 20, 17 says, thou shall not covet. Keep your attention focused on your own life, your own family, your own work, your own possessions. It doesn't say that you, you, you have to admire what you have or even like what you have. Just keep your eyes on what you have because no matter what you have, if your eyes begin to roam on what somebody else's have, that is a guarantee that you will no longer be satisfied with what you have. Because the guy, your brother-in-law who bought the new car, his neighbor got a new boat <laughs> and a hitch to pull it. Keep your eyes, this is just like a rule of thumb. Keep your eyes on your own stuff. Rule number two, how to be satisfied, simple rules. Give thanks for what you have. Before you ask for anything, make a careful inventory of what you already have. I mean, really what you have. And people are always thinking, well, uh, you know, I have a decent house. No, 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 no. The fact that your eyelids work. <laughs> have you ever thought what it would be like if your left eyelid did not work properly? Like your right eyelid was blinking, but the left one didn't work properly. That would mean, first of all, you'd look awfully strange just blinking with one eye. And then it would mean every few moments you'd have to put drops in that left eye to, you know, just think about that. Just that little tiny little nerve, if that little nerve wasn't working, how miserable your life would be. You, could, you couldn't read properly, you know. Be thankful that your nose works and does what it's, I mean, we could go through the entire anatomy, right? But I'm just trying to make a, trying to make a point work. Be happy that you have indoor plumbing. You know, in this group here, there's some that may remember indoor, uh, outdoor plumbing like as a life experience, because I see a lot of heads nodding. <laughs> I don't know what that's like at three in the morning to go uh, except at camp, you know what I'm saying? You will be amazed at how well off you are and the giving of thanks is a healthy spiritual exercise that is an enjoyable experience and one that pleases God. When I cannot sleep, I do not count sheep. When I can't fall asleep, I begin counting my blessings. I do, I, I do. Uh, you know, I, talk, I think about what, not what's not, well, there's plenty that's not working, but I, <laughs> I give thanks for what is working and our family, and our home, and a, you know, our children who are healthy, grandchildren who are born healthy. How many, even in our own congregation, have we prayed for these little babies who are terribly sick when they're born? That a little baby is born healthy with all its fingers and toes? That's something to be thankful for. And you know what, I, I've never, I've always, you know, I fall asleep before I, you know, I get to 10 things and I'm done, I'm, I'm asleep. Give thanks for what you do have because we do have a lot. Number three, little rules of thumb. Ask for what you need instead of complaining about what you do not have. Ask for what you need instead of complaining about what you do not have. Discouragement, envy, rivalry. These things take place when we feel that we are not getting our fair share of the blessings. When we say to ourselves, well, why him and not me? How come he's getting ahead and I'm not? So we're going to switch from Solomon and go to James, because James has a very good answer to that. James in chapter four says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, 
so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So he's saying a lot of things here, but one of the things he's saying is do not ask in comparison to others. In other words, don't go to God in prayer and say, I want what he's got. Because that's asking God to satisfy your lust. He's not going to answer that prayer. Ask for things that you need. Now the secret to the abundant, successful life is finding out what you really need. When you truly discover this, God will grant it to your joy and satisfaction. You know, a lot of times we ask for more money when what we really need is more self-control. Or we ask for an end to some kind of suffering or trial when what we really need is to find a closer relationship with God through the suffering. You know, I, I feel, truly feel badly for people who are not believers. Because when they suffer, when the trial is over, the only thing they've gotten out of that is maybe a little more patient, perhaps a little more understanding, a little more sympathy for other people who go through that same experience but they've gotten no spiritual benefit out of, out of it whatsoever. They've not drawn closer to God. They've gained no insight about spiritual life. Okay, so let's get back to Solomon, the view from the top. What does he see from the top? Oppression, envy. Third thing he mentions, disillusionment. And he says, then I looked again at vanity under the sun. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, yet there was no end to all his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, and for whom am I laboring and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. So here Solomon shares a kind of a reflective moment that such a top dog might have. And that is, he questions the reason why he fights so hard to get to and to stay on top when there's no real purpose to it, since when he dies, no one's going to benefit from his hard work. Neither did he while he was alive. So he worked, he worked, he worked. He sees what? He sees simply oppression and disillusionment. You know, he sees all these bad things while he's working so hard, doesn't get anything out of it. And he says, then I'm going to die and the person coming after me is not going to learn. You know, he's going to find this out for himself. Now, the sad thing about this is that most people in this position, you know, having climbed the ladder to the top, most people rarely have this insight. And when they do, uh, they have no recourse but to just keep playing the game. Um, I'm reminded of people who are compulsive gamblers. Compulsive gamblers, even if they know that the game is rigged against them, are still going to play because it's not about winning if you're a compulsive gambler, it's about playing. I had a, a relative who was a, he's, he's passed away now, but he was a compulsive gambler and I like the way he explained it to me once about, because he knew what he was. You know? He says, let me explain to you what <clears throat> being a gambler is like. Imagine if gambling was a, a drug you know, and it's in a needle. He says, okay, so if you win, ah, that was good. And then he says, if you lose, <laughs> he said, it doesn't matter if I win or lose, it's playing the game that I'm addicted to. And so Solomon is saying, you know, people scrap and fight to get to the top and even if they realize there may be nothing up there, they play the game anyways. So Solomon's view from the top, pretty bleak, right? What does he tell us? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Have you ever heard that saying? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. A quote attributed to Lord Acton who was a historian, <clears throat> 1887, Solomon sees this oppression being part of the game at the top. He says, yeah, there's oppression at the top, whatever, you know, it's part of the game. I just have to accept it. He says the best success, not him, but the best success is contentment. Well, actually, he does say that, you know, one handful. Success is many times bred by envy and it creates jealousy and rivalry. And so the best success 
is to be content in life, no matter where you are on the ladder. And then thirdly, life at the top is often lonely and full of disillusionment. It's never what it was cracked up to be. But if it's all you know, you're going to die trying to protect your spot. So we live you know, in a fast paced society, a great competitive spirit. Let's face it, in America, right? Let's, you know, free competition. I mean, that's, our whole society is based on competition. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's what we live in. So if we live in that kind of environment, the competitive spirit, let's, let's have some understanding about that, shall we? First of all, understand that competition is not wrong when it is used as a tool to produce excellence. You know, the Olympic Games, that's, you know, we know there's all the corruption that may surround it because so much money is involved. Wherever there's money, there's always corruption. But the idea of the game itself, the Olympic Games themselves, you know, rivalry between the best runners, for example, the fastest runners in the world, and notice you know, the difference, what, they beat each other by a tenth of a second, a half of a second, that's, that's the height of competition. Well, what, what are we seeing there? We're seeing excellence at the very top of a particular thing, running or throwing a ball or whatever it is. But competition, it's a good thing if it's meant to create excellence. Another idea, power is not wrong when it is used to bless the powerless. You know, one of the reasons, again, I don't want to go into do you like it or not, but one of the reasons why Mr. Trump won, just one of the reasons, is because he promised, who knows about the delivery, but he promised that he would help those who feel oppressed. Now, that's exactly what Mr. Obama said when he was elected. <laughs> It was exactly what Mrs. Clinton said, if she would have been elected. You know, if you elect me, I'm going to, nobody ever tries to get to be the president of our country by saying, if you elect me, I'm going to try to get the rich people even richer. Because <laughs> not enough rich people vote. So everybody understands that altruistic idea that there's nothing wrong with power if it's used to bless the powerless. So whatever power we have in our situation, whether it's financial or positional, we, if we use it to help others, that's a good thing. It's a blessing. Wealth is not wrong when it is understood that it is a stewardship from God and a stewardship for His service, not ours. As humans, you know, we naturally strive to improve and aim for goals. So here are the goals to aim for in order to avoid loneliness and the disillusionment that Solomon talks about if you make it to the top. Because you know, there are young men and women here who are people who have careers that I see in the, in the audience. And obviously no one says, you know what my goal is? My goal is to stay exactly here at this desk for the next 30 years, never move up. No, nobody thinks like that. Everybody wants to move up. Everybody wants a bigger job, better job, get to the top. Nothing wrong with that. Part of our nature. But within that thinking and within that society, let's remember a couple of things, shall we? Let's aim for contentment each day, not increased production. It's okay to be good at your job, but remember, being good at your job and all that, does, if you yourself are not content, what's the point? And remember the little rules we talked about, about being content, keep your eyes on your own stuff, give thanks for what you have, you know? And strive to be useful wherever you are, not to be number one. What did Jesus say? The greatest of all will be the servant of all. Those of you who have worked as managers or supervisors, if you've had that experience in your work life, isn't it great when you have some assistants or people on the floor who just, boss, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll take care of it. Don't you love to have one of those men or women who have that kind of attitude? Oh, it makes your job so great. 
Strive to be useful wherever you are, not to be number one. Because if you strive to be number one, there's a lot of uh, kissing up involved, <laughs> shall I say. And then thirdly, work at being faithful to God, to your spouse, to your friends, to your work. Not faultless, not perfect. I love what Marty says, it's his, but I'll, you know, we all know it's his, he said it a lot of times, but I'll borrow it. He says, I'm not a perfect husband, but I'm a faithful one. Yeah, so true. I'm not a perfect manager, but I'm a faithful one. I'm faithful to the company and I'm faithful to my people. I got my, I got my people's back. You know, I may make mistakes and all that business, but you can count on me. I'll be there for you. That's so beautiful to see in a person. So do these things, whether you're at the top or at the bottom, you'll be okay. You'll make it in this very difficult, competitive world that we live in. So that's the class for today. Thank you very much.